Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. He's back in the bullpen today. We have Mr. Addison Hosner, commentator, young voice, a very smart guy. He has a BA in journalism, has a JD degree, an MS in negotiation and conflict resolution, an MS in government organizational leadership, and you know, very accomplished guy. So, welcome back to the show, sir. How are you? Well, thank you for the esteemed introduction, doctor. It's great to be back. Let's get Absolutely. into it. Let's get into it. We're gonna talk about the parental rights bill from the state of Florida in particular. There are other versions of it in other states, including Georgia. It has been dubbed the don't say gay bill, which is a front leaning narrative. It is not called that obviously in the title of the actual bill. But I wanna get your thoughts. I don't wanna presume what you know or believe about the bill. So give me your sentiment and I will then opine. Okay, well. Down here in Florida, as a native Floridian, uh, we're having to deal with the fallout of this being signed into into law not too long ago. Uh, the bill itself, in my opinion, was fronted as this guise of allowing parents to have more control over what their students are learn or what their children are learning in schools. Uh, however, to me, it runs amok of a lot of First Amendment free uh, free speech issues. Not on behalf of the teachers, since they're government employees, their rights to speak unfettered in schools is limited. But students have those rights. They don't leave those rights at the schoolhouse gate just by going to school. So for me, the don't say gay nomiker, I think, uh, while catchy and has got the attention of America, I think kind of undersells the other problematic areas of what this bill actually is going to occur and accomplish. And primarily in the vague language of uh, developmentally or age appropriate discourse between teachers and students. And we're giving the state the ability to determine what is age appropriate or developmentally appropriate. So. Whether you're on the right or the left, I see that as a, as a problem and a, and a big issue when it comes to free speech and the liberty of these children. So overall, I am not a, a supporter of the bill. I understand where it was coming from, but like so many of these bills, the actual intent uh, lies beneath the words. You know, I agree with you completely. You and I concur on that. I wanna read a couple of dynamics out of this and make a few observations and see how you feel about them. Um, so this particular bill, I call this a red meat bill. Um, what it literally does is it says, as the government, we're really not going to do anything. We're gonna pass a bill and then we're gonna make you feel like you are empowered to do something uh, because of this bill. And it feeds a particular group, it feeds a particular demographic. Let's be very clear, the number one reason, number one reason why statutes, new laws are deemed unconstitutional is because of vagueness. Vagueness is the number one reason. So let me read the vagueness of this bill. The bill actually says, um, the bill says classroom instruction by school personnel or third parties on sexual orientation or gender identity may not occur in kindergarten through third or in a manner that is not age appropriate or developmentally appropriate for students in accordance with state standards. Well, the state really hasn't created those standards uh, in a way that that policy and law can coincide, it's kind of case by case. And then it says parents will be able to sue districts over violations. Well, sue them for what? Sue them for protected speech, another student brings it up in the classroom. Um, sue them because a teacher taught um, a lesson that connected back to gender identity when the bill allows for gender identity to be taught as long as it is appropriate, right? So how do you enforce that? And I think that's the point you were making as well, is that it is vague. But here's the thing, brother, it's not vague by default, it's vague by design. Mm -hmm. They designed it this way so that it had no actual teeth, but it gave people who were calling for this kind of legislation something to sink their teeth into. This is to me one of the greatest violations of public trust. Democrats do it too, where they create bills to distract you from the reality of what's happening in K through 12 education. They created bills about critical race theory, teachers don't teach critical race theory. They're creating bills about don't say gay in the classroom. These, none of these are education led, none of these are teacher led. Right, because these are not the problems that school teachers are having in the classroom. So here's what goes down, brother. My mother is a school teacher, she's a high school teacher. The problems that they actually have do not get any room in the legislature when you have these extremes happening on a daily basis under that gold dome. 
And that's the problem I have with this. They act as if they give a damn about children. They refuse to acknowledge and pass policies that can help with actual issues such as bullying and racial bullying in school systems. They won't take that up, but they will tell you that saying gay is a problem, all right, or something to that nature. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about what I just said? I mean, I'm I'm on board with it, and I think you bring up a good point, and it's something that it, it jumps out to me as you know, reminiscent of you know George Orwell's 1984. Mm -hmm. uh, for those who've read that book, there's this concept of double speak where the government begins to legislate what you can and cannot say. And so to get around it, people begin to say the opposite or something different. And it has a completely different meaning compared to what they're actually saying. That's the double speak. And so I think of that when I look at a bill like this, where the the whole intent that the DeSantis and the, the Florida House and Senate, because they had two different bills going at the same time with the identical language as the House bill that eventually passed. But the whole point was, oh, it's going to increase the fundamental right of a parent to upbring their child and rear them how they see fit. Well, I think it's somewhat a double edged sword. If you're trying to increase the liberty of the parent, what about the liberty of the child? You're restricting the liberty of a child to speak freely in this country, but you're then allowing the parent to determine what the kid can say. To me, that is just, it's hypocritical. You can't be supportive of liberty while also restricting it. You need That's to go right. one of both ways. And to your point as well about you know the overall uh, the intent here of the language and the ambiguity of developmentally appropriate or age appropriate. So many proponents who have come after me since I wrote an opposition piece about this bill have begun to tell me that well it says K through three. Do you really think five and eight to eight year olds should be taught about gender identity? To which I respond, well, of course not. But I don't think that's a, that's happening. I don't think a curriculum is out there that says this stuff is being discussed with these children. It's that vagueness in the language though that defeats their whole point of saying it's to protect the children K through three. Developmentally or age appropriate, what's to stop someone from saying, I don't think a 12 year old should be having these conversations. I don't think that's developmentally appropriate. So now you've extended this bill's reach from K through three, as you were saying, K through 12. I don't think it's appropriate for a 17 year old to be talking about transgender rights. Thus, I'm gonna sue the school on the taxpayer's dime and make us all pay for this. To me, it's gonna just increase frivolous lawsuits, and in particular, right now, while the Republican government is in place, this bill suits whatever narrative they're trying to build to rally their base. But what happens if the state turns blue? Well, now that age appropriate and developmentally appropriate standard is going to change to a bluer standard, I would imagine. And so now it's not gonna hurt the right people, as I've heard many times about these type of bills. It's to hurt the right people. Um, so when you leave amb ambiguity and vagueness out there like this in these bills, like you said, it's by design. But I think that same design could be turned on its head and used against the people who put this in place thinking they were circumventing whatever laws they were able to accomplish. Um, it's problematic all around uh, from the teacher's standpoints, from the counselors at the schools, from the students. It's just nothing good comes out of this. And I, I just, as a constitutional supporter, as a, as a staunch classical liberal, I really do not like it when the government is entrouncing on what speech can, can or cannot be said, regardless of what you think is appropriate. That's not something that the state should be involved in, but um, your thoughts. Very well said, brother, very well said. Uh, one of the greatest ironies of the bill is that it calls itself a parental rights bill, right? Mm -hmm. But it literally is a ban. It calls itself a parental rights bill, but it bans something. And, and they have contextualized this as this enhances the freedoms of a parent, but it is a ban. Right, which takes away the freedom from a parent who may disagree with the ban. Let's also talk about Disney and the interplay with Disney. Mm -hmm. And and I want to ask you this as a constitutional guy and the JD recipient, okay? Right now, you have the governor of an entire state who has held a press conference and proclaimed that they are going to penalize Disney. Mm -hmm. Okay. For what? They're going to penalize Disney. Because of Disney's support of the LGBTQ community and their adversarialness as it relates to legislation they disagree with. Would you not agree with me, brother, that companies like Disney love them or hate them? They do possess the freedom of political speech. Do you agree with that? Yes, I would agree. Okay. Um, yeah. All right, I'm going somewhere with this. Since okay. Disney enjoys the protection, more than the comfort, the protection 
of political speech, which is codified under our First Amendment. It basically says, hey, government can't do anything to abridge that speech, it's protected speech. You can't be punished for this speech, it's protected, right? By Governor DeSantis saying, we are going to punish Disney because we don't like what they've said about my legislation. Is that not a classical definition of violating their freedom of speech, their protected political speech? When the government is saying, we're going to now punish Disney because they have disagreed with us by way of their speech. Yeah, I think you're kind of onto a good fact pattern there. And I wouldn't be surprised that if DeSantis and his crew were able to go through with what they are asserting, which is stripping Disney of their independent rights within the state of Florida. I could see Disney attorneys bringing that exact case that you're mentioning. Any First Amendment violation of speech would have to be from the government. And in this case, I think you would have a, I mean, that's a strong fact pattern I haven't given too much thought to. But yes, the way you word it, if DeSantis is using a retaliation and using his governmental powers to silence Disney from being able to say certain things or or bring up points in support. I could see that you know being brought as their defense. Um, I also take issue with DeSantis. I am located in Orlando right now, I'm about 35 mm-hmm. minutes east of the Magic Kingdom right now. Um, if he were to go through with what he is asserting and, and to really go after Disney, he is gonna cripple the economy of this state. I'm not sure what Disney will do. They can't pick up the Magic Kingdom and, and fly it to you know Delaware or something, but they can start pulling out their activity. Over 60,000 employees are employed by Disney here in the state of Florida. And I think Governor DeSantis would be a little bit more cautious in what he is saying towards the company that largely is is the reason for our tourism industry and a lot of our tax money. So, I mean, in general, I don't like it when any political affiliate, whether it's our executive all the way up at the president, down to governors or, or congressmen, begin to lash out at people for simply voicing opposition. That is, you know, you're allowed to have political debate. You're allowed to go into the the Senate floor and not agree with one another. But when someone speaks out against a governmental bill, well, that's that's encoded in your in your First Amendment rights, the ability to protest, and it's just it's concerning all around. And and once again, it's 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 about limiting speech that they don't want to hear. And yep. you know, George Orwell, I think, had the excellent quote that just, you know, it's all about it's not about preventing speech you don't want to hear from being said. It's the speech you don't want to hear that you need to hear in order to be able to understand, to comprehend, and find a resolution. And in this case, I don't think there is a resolution to the people who want this type of bill. Their resolution is to cancel out and prevent those who dissent from being able to speak. And that should concern almost every single American, regardless of political affiliation. We don't want these things. And as you've seen and we've all seen, they're popping up everywhere. Uh, Idaho has one, Texas. I mean, it's. I think multiple states, almost double digit states have these new don't say gay type bills. And that that should give everyone a a great moment of pause to stop and think how much power do you want to give your governments in controlling what can and cannot be said. Um, It's un-American to me. Yeah, let's talk about those employees because you're right, 60,000 employees, direct staff members, you have roughly 100,000 when you calculate contract workers, vendors, etc. Those are the support mechanisms. Um, connected to Disney. So he's willing to punish basically 100,000 workers. Uh, That's a dent in a state economy. That's a huge dent in the state economy. Also, 14 economists said if he actually goes through with this, the uh, taxes will rise in Florida by thousands for each person. The latest estimate said every Floridian will pay between 2,500 to 2,800 in more taxes. So you have an expansion of government, you have a First Amendment violation, you have an increase of taxes, but they get to hide behind the notion that somehow they are patriots. When they are literally creating legislation that solves no actual problem that currently exists. This problem does not exist and they're making legislation over it. And because a company or a person or a group of people dare to say this is a nothing burger, this should not be some, something we have a legislative focus on. They're willing to use the government to, to, uh, to hurt individuals inside of their own state. Now, he's not the only one, brother. Let me take you to Texas just a few days ago. The Texas governor signed an executive uh, action where he had his state troopers go out and stop all of these trucks coming in from Mexico. And he said he was cracking down 
on uh, illegal immigration, right? That's what he said, okay? And, and by the way, no person is illegal. Uh, so he says, I'm doing this to crack down on it. But he didn't have the law on his side to actually go inside of the trucks or check the trucks. It was just a ploy. A trucker ended up calling it out for what it was. A trucker went on social media and said, this guy's new policy is stopping our ability to transport goods. And it was killing the economy of Texas by $100 million a day. Now, we know the governor was aware of the numbers. He was aware of the numbers before the trucker went on social media and said something about it. But as soon as that trucker broke down what was really happening and how it was strangling the economy and said that the governor is doing this for one reason, to maintain inflation, to increase inflation in his state so that he could blame it on Democrats in the midterm elections and maybe ride it out to the presidential. As soon as that thing went viral, brother, the governor came back out the next day and overturned his own executive action, which to me was proof that it was the reason he did it in the first place, all right? So this is nothing new, the state of Georgia did something very similar when Coca-Cola was saying, we stand against the voter restriction bill in the state of Georgia. Coca-Cola right. came against it, other companies came against it, Major League Baseball came against it. What did Georgia do? They threatened Coca-Cola with uh, taking away their tax abatements because they disagreed with them politically on a statutory issue, which means once again, First Amendment violation here. Uh, because that's protected political speech. And then uh, members of the, of the United States Congress got involved and started saying the same thing. They started saying, we're now going to implement uh, laws uh, to punish these companies that we don't like uh, in reference to their political speech. So this is not new. So the question is, where does it stop? Where does it stop? How do you hold your party accountable? Or let, let me say this, what do you hold? I don't want to say your party, but conservatives in general. How do conservatives? come out of this and still hold other conservatives accountable who are blatantly violating the simple political freedoms and and free speech that people have. It's gonna start with accountability from the party. First, I think to weed out what is the cancer in, in the Republican mm. party at this point. And that's the, the Majory Tyler Greens, the um, uh, Chuck Grassley, the, the types of right wing politicians that are, are adamantly throwing this type of, I think it's just aggressive legislation. I don't think it serves the purpose, especially based upon you know the examples you've given. The intent isn't to actually accomplish things for the betterment of the societies and the communities they represent. It's to, again, hurt the right people, accomplish the right result that rallies the base to help them in their election. There's no actual long term plan for any of this. And you know, as far as trying to make the party recognize that, there are a few who have been very open against really the Trumpism that took over the Republican Party. And you know, oddly enough, Mitt Romney has become an ally of that movement within his own party. He's routinely been lambasted by other Republicans for voting against party lines. And I think he voted to confirm Justice Jackson as well. It's gonna require leaders within the Republican Party to kind of establish a new breakaway to return a return to a a level of not dignity or accountability to to oneself. Um, right now, a lot of that party is putting party over country, and I have a big problem with that. Um, I, I don't recognize myself as a member of either major political party, but I I certainly would like to see more accountability on that side because when you when you run into these situations where governors are being so brash to put forth bills without any any precedent that gives them the power or the authority. It, it signals to you that they're not afraid of any consequences that may come or they think they have it in the bag come reelection season. And nothing's more scary than a, a, a democracy run by politicians who know they have nothing to lose. And it's up to the voter to recognize that. But once again, getting people to not vote party lines come November, especially on the right after they've you know made it well known that they think this whole election cycle has been rigged. Uh, it's going to be problematic and quite frankly, we'll probably have a discussion again around that time. Yeah. We need better people in politics, we just need better people. I'm gonna say this and I mean it, a coward wants to know, is it safe? A politician wants to know, is it popular? A public servant wants to know, is it right? And we have left that common notion 
of is it right? Brother, I can't tell you how many meetings I've been in. And an hour into the meeting, the back and forth, the discussion, the argumentation, and nobody posed the question, what is the right thing to do? I appreciate you and I appreciate what you bring to the conversation. I'm thankful that people like you exist to provide nuance and context to a world that has become increasingly tribal over the years. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, doctor, for having me again, a wonderful conversation. Hopefully we can spark the change. We will, brother, we will.